WJCT Studios in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm Ray Hollister. I'm Tom Braun. And this is Deemable Tech, tech help worth listening to. This week's episode of the Deemable Tech podcast is brought to you by A Small Orange Homegrown Hosting, a refreshingly different approach to web hosting. On the web at asmallorange.com. And if you haven't done so already, make sure to subscribe to Deemable Tech Podcast. Just go to iTunes and search for Deemable Tech. Or you can go to deemable.com slash iTunes to take you directly to our iTunes page. Uh, you can also subscribe to our YouTube page at youtube.com slash deemable tech. And we're on the Facebook and the Twitter. <laughs> Just search for Deemable Tech. Got a question about your computer, smartphone, tablet, or the internet? Give us a call at 1-888-972-9868, or you can send us an email at questions at deemable.com. So if you were listening to last week's episode, uh, we have started a new Amazon gift card contest. Hooray! Yes! So all you have to do to an- is answer a few questions about the Deemable Tech Podcast. Now don't worry, it's not a trivia contest. We just need your opinion on a few questions. So if you could take a few minutes and answer our survey, it would really help us out a lot. And just for doing so, you'll be entered to win a $20 Amazon gift card. Mm-hmm. That you can spend on whatever you want. As Anything. long as it's from Amazon. Well, if it, yeah. It's Which be is a Amazon. lot of stuff. Yeah, they got a lot of stuff. Uh, you can don't... buy groceries if you yeah. want to. That's a really boring thing to do with your money, though. So well, They don't you know. have helicopters or cars. They or have toy helicopters and toy cars. Russian mail order brides. I don't think they have those on Amazon. Okay. I hope not. Anyways, so all you have to do is go to deemable.com and click the link to take the survey. You can't miss it. It'll be the first or second article at the top of the page every day until the contest is over, which, speaking of which, there's a lot of witches there. I don't know why. Eh, Halloween's coming up soon. It, the contest ends September 30th, so don't wait. Go submit your survey answers right now, unless you're watching the show live, all three of you. Then, if that's you, wait till the show's over and answer the questions then. Which, speaking of another witch, speaking of questions, Tom, do, you, do we have any questions? Do we have any questions? Do we have any questions? Yes, we have questions. Oh, okay. We have questions about how to wipe an iPhone, whether you should buy an AMD or an Intel laptop, ooh. eternal question, the best way to host unique email addresses, and more. Ooh, ooh, and we talk about our new toys, too. That's right. We both have fun new gadgets. Yes. And uh, Ray has an iPhone 5S. I do. And I finally got my hands on the semi-mythical Chromecast. Nice. But first, we're going to dive into a couple of questions, starting with this one from Martha. Martha. Yeah. Which, if I can pull it up. Martha writes, I am a middle school art teacher. Oh, poor you. My classroom is long and narrow and set up for projection on the center of one of the walls. With large classes of 44 students plus, nearly half of them cannot see the examples and demonstrations that I am projecting. Having 16 to 20 students move their seats every time I want to show them something eats up way too much class time. Mm. I'm looking for a way to project the same image on the side and end wall at the same time. And, of course, on a school teacher's budget. I have a laptop and an LCD projector. I thought about trying to add a TV to the setup. How? Will it work? Is there a better and or cheaper option? Thanks, guys. Great question. Uh, mm-hmm. thank, thank you, Martha. That's, uh, that was challenging. Um, it all depends on your setup, uh, how you've got things set up there. I'm assuming that, you have, that you're connecting your laptop to your projector with a VGA cable. Uh, A VGA cable, the ends of it look like an upside-down trapezoid. You're an art teacher, so you should probably know what that looks like. Um, And it has three rows of five pins each. And it's usually blue. Yeah, it's usually blue. blue. Yeah. Um, And that used to be the standard for for most monitors or projector cables. Uh, You may be using HDMI or DVI. Those look completely different. They're more flat. Um, so this would be, these instructions would be a little bit different if that's the case. Uh, but most likely you're running VGA. So I'm going to assume that a lot of projectors have an extra VGA out port. Like they have one for in and one for out. Uh, and the reason why is so that you can daisy chain them. Daisy chain them. Yeah. Basically what that means is you connect them to each other. So you would connect the laptop to the projector Mm -hmm. and then the projector to another projector. Mm. And theoretically you could keep doing that you know, as many projectors as you could get a hold of. That'd be weird, but you could put a whole bunch of projectors together Mm -hmm. that way. And that lets you multiply the projectors you have. So if you have that, then it's pretty simple. All you have to do is plug in another projector or possibly plug in that TV, which we'll come back to. Um, Either way, um, if you, well, not either way. If you don't have a projector with a out port, then you'll have to get a VGA splitter. It's a really simple cable that literally has one side is a female 
uh, plug. The other side is two males. Um, and you can usually find them for 10 to $20 online. Um, even Radio Shack and like Office Depot or CompUSA or, or no, they're gone. Tiger Direct, they have them. Mm-hmm. Um, you can find them for a lot more expensive. But unless you're running like over 50 feet, you don't really need a very expensive one that like has a power supply and all that. Now, if I was doing this and I just had an unlimited supply of money, I would hook up another projector on the other side of the room. Um, but since you mentioned that you're on a school teacher's budget, and if I had to guess, you're probably play- paying out of pocket for this, I expect you don't have a lot of money to throw at this problem. Um, so you mentioned that you have a TV and that you could add to the setup. That most likely will work, but you may have to buy some adapters to connect the laptop to the television set. If you're really lucky, you're really lucky, if it's a high-end TV you know, within the last five years, uh, it might have a VGA import on it, a VGA connection where you can just plug it in. Um, if you're not so lucky, which I expect you're probably not, you may have to buy an adapter, which they can run anywhere from $50 to $200, depending on which type of adapter you need. Um, it all depends on what kind of ports the TV has on it. It could be as far back as an RCA, which are those little round <laughs> plugs with the cord in the middle, um, or it could be HDMI or DVI, or it could have a VGA. Hopefully, you're going to be lucky and it's going to have that VGA I connection. I think a lot do have a VGA, at least the ones I've seen in schools. The newer ones, yeah. And they usually the IT guys purchase them intentionally. Because yeah, usually they're meant to be hooked up to laptops. So yeah. yeah. Hopefully, you're going to luck out. There's going to be a VGA port on it or whatever port you're using to connect your laptop to the projector. Right. Either way, you're going to need a cable to run from your laptop or from the other projector if it's got a, a daisy chain connection to the other side of the room where the TV is. Or if you do what I say and get another projector, you know, that. Um, you can pick up a VGA cable, a 50-foot cable, for around $15 to $60 online. They don't have to be that fantastic. Uh, you're not, you know, it's not going to lose signal degradation over 50 feet. They've got some crazy ones that are like gold-plated, and <laughs> it's ridiculous. But in around $15, you can get a pretty good 50-foot 50, 50 connection. 50-foot. Yeah, 50 foot. <laughs> so best case scenario, this is going to cost you about $50. Worst case scenario, it might cost you closer to $200. I have an alternative suggestion. Okay, um, bring it on. And it's somewhat limited. Well, I'm just going to, we're going to talk about this more in a little bit. Um, but a Chromecast might solve oh, that problem of the 50 foot connection. Chromecast. Or uh, an Apple TV or, or some TV, similar yeah. kind That's of true. thing. That's true. I didn't think about a wireless connection. Yeah, you could ha- basically. I always avoid wireless if at all possible. Um, yeah, depending depending on what she's doing with it. But uh, it, stay tuned, and we're going to talk about uh, the Chromecast yeah, a little bit. Talk about that in a little bit. Um, either way, I hope I hope that helps. Um, if that does seem doable to you, but you still need some more help, you're not sure about the connections. Do us a favor. Um, you can do this. We're going to do this for you because you're a school teacher. Take a picture of the back of your laptop and a picture of the back of your projector where you plug in the laptop, and then take a picture of your TV, the back where the ports are, um, and and send those to us at questions at deemable.com. We need those to tell you more specifically what exact cables or adapters you'll need. But if you send us those pictures, uh, we'll take another look at it and help you out. Okay? Thanks. Cool. All right, we have more questions. That's right. We got a, a one from Mallory. Could you uh, read that? I can read it. Do you want me to? I do. Okay. Mallory writes, are AMD processors the generic processors in comparison to Intel Celeron processors? I'm shopping for a laptop, and I'm finding that the price of the AMD is more alluring, Mm. but not more than the specs on the i5 Intel processor. If I bought an AMD processor in a laptop, will I be disappointed when I visit my grandma and she's playing solitaire on an i5? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Thanks for the question, Mallory. Um, so the way you framed the question makes me kind of think you're comparing, you know, this to like, you know, Tylenol to the gener- with the generic store brand, you know, medicine. Yeah. Processors don't quite work the same way. Um, you know, AMD isn't just uh, the off-brand version of Intel. Sure. Um, they're separate companies. They, they're separate, you know, processors. They're made to be basically compatible, but under the hood, there's lots of little differences. Oh, yeah, um, definitely. Probably billions of little differences because they're complicated little things. Um, AMD had kind of a heyday back in the 90s. Uh, yeah, I personally, true. at that time, owned a couple of desktops 
that had AMD processors, and they could really go toe to toe with the more expensive Intel machines. Sure, you know, and I was on a high schooler's budget, so that was definitely good for me. Yeah. Um, but things have really changed. Um, AMD machines are often quite cheap these days, but they just aren't up to par with Intel machines. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. No, I'm not talking about performance either. I mean, you're generally going to see better performance on Intel's. But it's the battery life uh, is a big one. Oh. Intel laptops versus AMD laptops, your Intel laptop is going to have much better battery life. Hmm. Intel job chips are just uh, they're doing a better job with power management. Hmm. And I would also suspect, and again, this is sort of like, this is a little bit of an intangible, but I think you're going to have a smoother, more quirk-free experience with, your, uh, with an Intel machine. Hmm. Um, it's just a better chip. Now, even... Even price doesn't have to hold you back from buying an Intel, though, because I recently helped a friend shop for an Intel laptop that was under $500. Uh, now, there are definitely some real bargain basement uh, AMD laptops, but, you know, once you get down to that $250 range, you're looking at a pretty poor laptop experience. Yes, you are. Um, and I'd begin to start thinking about getting a Chromebook for that email and web browsing laptop, you know, that's, if that's what you're after. That's what we're always telling people. If you're spending less than 300 bucks, look at a Chromebook, because... Mm -hmm. You can't get a good Windows PC for under three hundred bucks. No. They're out there. There's tons of Windows PCs out there for under three hundred bucks, and they're horrible. <laughs> they're they're horrific experiences unless you're buying used, and that's always different. Yeah, but so it is possible to get higher end AMD processors that have clock speeds on par with lower end Intel processors. Um, but Intel they really just make a better chip. I'm a strong proponent of going Intel. I think you'll just save yourself a lot of headaches. Mm. Um, uh, so unless you are planning on buying your laptop based purely on price, I would not get an AMD. Oh, good to know. Yeah, I'm the same way. Back in the 90s and early 2000s, I had a bunch of AMD computers mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. the time. I didn't realize it was such a big difference now. Yeah. yeah. All right, we got another question from Bill. Can you read that one? Sure. Will you read it? Uh, I will. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Grammar Nazi. <laughs> uh, Bill writes, one of the icons on my iPad screen is called Notes. Notes. It's a yellow legal pad app that I have often used to make notes in meetings. How do I print those notes off my iPad using my MG6220 Canon printer? Thanks. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, thanks for your question, Bill. Um, notes, of course, is the built-in app for writing notes. Um, you're obviously using iOS 6 or earlier because iOS 7, it stopped looking like a notepad. And now it actually looks like a piece of paper. Uh, they talk about getting rid of skeuomorphism in iOS 7, but I realized today I'm like, Wait, that's a piece of paper. It's still got to in some way it's represent what it is, I guess. Yeah. So. I thought at first it was just blank white and uh, like like uh, Google uh, Drive is. Mm -hmm. Like in Docs, it's just white paper. But no, it's actually a, it looks like a piece of paper. But anyways, um, fortunately, I looked up your printer, Bill, uh, the MG6220, such a fancy name. Mm. Um, it is AirPrint ready. Uh, now, what AirPrint is is the Apple uh, proto... Uh, I can't remember the word. Wireless? Yeah, it allows you to print from your iOS or Apple device wirelessly um, or any other device that's AirPrint ready. A lot of Android ones are now AirPrint ready as well as being Google Cloud print ready. Mm -hmm. So you can automatically print from your iPad. So what you have to do, as long as you're both, you have the printer and your iPad on the same network, they're both logged into the same Wi-Fi account, you can print directly from them. All you have to do is tap the action button on notes. So if you have the keyboard up, you'll have to hit done. Um, but once you go back to the, the view screen, on the bottom of your screen, there'll be an action button. In, in iOS 6, it's a square with an arrow kind of pointing sort of to the right. It's like making a little loop to the right. If you, when you update to iOS 7, it's a square with an arrow pointing up. Uh, but from then, you'll get a menu that'll pop up. I don't remember exactly how it appears on iOS 6, but it'll say a few options like copy and print. Hit print and then choose the printer that will show up on your network for AirPrint. And uh, that's it. That's pretty much it. You just hit print and then walk over to your printer and it's printing. So there you go. There we go. All right. So that was easy. And I'll include a link uh, with some instructions on how to do that in iOS 6 as well. But we have to take a break. Yeah, but stay tuned because when we come back, we are going to do some reviews. Yes, we're going to talk about our toys. Yeah. So you're listening to Deemable Tech.
Welcome back to Deemable Tech. I'm Ray Hollister, joined, of course, by my co-host, Tom Brown. And so if you follow us on Twitter, which is at Deemable, or if you follow me on Twitter, I'm at Ray Hollister, then you know that I spent Friday morning, the 20th, waiting in line at the Apple Store for the iPhone 5S. Now, Ray, I know you're an Apple fan. Yes, of course. Um, but I always thought you said people that lined up overnight for iPhone launches were idiots. What's up with that? Oh, yeah. Don't get me wrong. I still think they're idiots. I've just accepted that I'm one of them. <laughs> no, it, uh, you know, all kidding aside, um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I was surprised at how much fun it was. We hung out. We talked. Uh, we were cracking up. turtlenecks. I definitely thought that I was going to be in a Samsung commercial at any moment. It really <laughs> felt like the commercial... There were there were middle aged people, there were young people, there were hipsters, there were people who have been at every single launch since the original iPhone. There was actually one guy who was two people behind me, and uh, he had been at every Apple launch since the two hundred fifty six uh, gig iPod Classic. Wow! I was like, you got problems. I don't know. <laughs> Everyone um, needs a hobby. Yeah, I originally was going to get up at four and go. Um, but around two o'clock I was, I couldn't sleep. I was like, I'm going to oversleep. So I get up, I go and uh, I ended up being uh 16th in line. So I ended up getting there about 3am and I got my iPhone 5S at just after eight o'clock. Uh, so it wasn't too bad. I mean, okay. five hours yeah. hanging out, having fun. They gave us some, some food. Uh, it was really cool. Um, but I, I didn't prepare for it. Mm -hmm. Um, I was busy all day Thursday, had some personal stuff going on. Uh, so I was about to pass out from exhaustion by the time I got home. There was definitely a moment where I was heading down the road going, Oh, I need to stay in between the lines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you want to read all the highlights, uh, you can check out my Twitter feed. It's at Ray Hollister. Uh, I live tweeted from the event. Originally I thought I was going to, uh, interview people and, yeah. and, and do oh. that. that and I was going to use my iPhone for that. Mm -hmm. And then shortly before I left, I realized, wait a minute, I'm trading in my iPhone 4S. I'm not really going to have time to upload the That's audio. True. That's so. true. Yeah. But there was plenty of news there. They, they covered it extensively. So what's your verdict? Was it worth the wait and the money? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it's really great. Um, you know, there's nothing that stands out on this that's like, wow, that's amazing. Uh, the Touch ID is pretty cool, the, yeah. uh, the, the fingerprint sensor. Um, you know, they, they mentioned this during the Apple announcement, but most people don't have passcodes on their iPhones. That's true. Because they just don't want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. I've never had a, a passcode on mine until I got this one. Um, and it is, I now have a 35 plus character passcode. <laughs> it's really long. Um, but all I do is touch the touch the screen, the sensor, and boom, I'm in. Mm. It's really easy. Aren't you concerned about the pro possibility that someone who wants to do your iPhone <laughs> might hack off your finger and and freeze it, you know, and then you know cryogenically, and then use it to access your iPhone? I will try to explain to them before they try to cut off my finger that listen, you don't have to do that. It's not going to work. I'll give you my passcode. It'll take you forever to enter it, but you know it because. Apparently, it uh, does does detect if there is a pulse. Uh, it detects if you're, there's uh, electricity going through your finger. It's one or the other. I can't uh, I guess remember which. they'll just which. have to kidnap you then. Yeah, I mean, then and keep me. They're going to have to take me and the phone. Or I could just give them my passcode. Because you can always just enter the passcode. Yeah. Because when you slide to unlock, it asks for the passcode. Okay. So that always works. Um, my daughter is a little upset about the uh, the passcode. She figured out that she can't use my iPhone anymore uh, that without my a, permission. A good question: Can you have multiple fingerprints on file? Yes, it does. Up, I think we may. Amber and I may have said ten, and I we were wrong if we did say that. Uh, there was only five. Uh, okay. So I've got my index fingers and my thumbs, and Amber's index finger. Okay. So she can open it if she needs to use my phone for something. Oh, cool. So and sh she has my passcode saved in LastPass. So mm -hmm. if she feels like entering all thirty-five plus characters, <laughs> she can do it that way. Um, I've it works almost every single time I've used it. There was only one time where I had a problem when my fingers were wet, and I tried to unlock it, and it gave me an error. Mm -hmm. And I did it again, not realizing it. I did it three times, and then if you do it three times, it doesn't work. You have to enter your passcode. Oh, fun. So then you just go back to the old-fashioned way, and you enter your passcode. So <laughs> it's fantastic with the App Store. Um, I love that because that's the biggest time where I hate entering my password. Oh, yeah. Um, and 
I use two different iCloud accounts, one that me and Amber share for our apps mm-hmm. and one that I use by myself for iMessages, and then I have my passcode. So there's three passwords I have to remember which one's which. Right. And with this, I just touch it, and it does the right one. So I'm hoping that they open up the API for developers uh, so that other developers can incorporate that. Because I'd love to be able just to touch the fingerprint sensor and not have to enter a password mm-hmm. for a lot of different things. So yeah, the, the Touch ID is great. Um, the A7 processor is really snappy. Um, they actually said it's faster than all the other Android phones on the market oh, sure. and the bench testing the for now <laughs> until next month and the yep. next Android device comes out. Um, it's significantly faster than my iPhone 4S. Um, and it's a, quite a, it's a bit faster than uh, my friend's iPhone 5. Uh, we were doing some like mock benchmark tests, like pulling up uh, different apps and pulling up can, different Safari pages. Yeah, and uh, it, it did come up a lot faster. I've noticed that videos launch a lot faster. Oh yeah, uh, they cool. they also buffer faster. Hmm. Of course, I'm on LTE now, whereas the 4S was on 3G. Sure. Although its sprint here in Jacksonville isn't that hot, <laughs> but uh, it, it is a heck of a lot faster. I was pulling eight megabits down. And uh, nice. two megabits up versus you know one up and down <laughs> usually before on three G. Um, of course, the M seven, the new motion chip. I, I have no idea mm-hmm. what it does. You haven't. Kept I mean, your I know what it does. Your but... iPad, uh, your iPhone beside you on your pillow. You know. No, I mean, well, actually, I did try my uh, my motion sleep app. It's not working well with iOS seven. Huh. Uh, but once they get that updated, I see. Uh, I don't know. It's. Is this supposed to act as a pedometer or something? Yeah, I mean, it's stuff that it's always done before, but instead of using the main processor, it's got a separate processor for it. Right, but do you have that turned on? Have you you tried counting your steps with your iPhone? I haven't, no. I mean, I should see if it makes a difference on battery life. I'll try that out. I'll let you know next week. Um, The larger screen size, it did take a little bit for me to get used to, especially with my Megan Fox thubs, (laughs) my my little short thumbs. Um, (laughs) That's, so the only, that's the best way to describe them. They look like Megan Fox's thumbs, if you've ever seen hers. Um, so I have to like readjust my 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 position with my phone, and that took a while to get used to. Yeah, that's a that's a massive screen, man. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it, it's it's certainly not a, a Galaxy S three or or four, um, but it's bigger. I mean it's longer screen. Um, so, anyways, the camera is is great. Uh, it's got a good camera on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the burst mode was really cool. That is where you can hold down the picture button or the capture button, and it'll take up to 10 pictures per second. I, I tried it with my daughter, Zoe. She ran past and smiled as she was running by, and it figures out which is the best picture. Um, I guess it uses an algorithm to figure out what would make the best picture. Obviously, focus is involved. Mm-hmm. And um, the way it frames the picture, uh, like where the 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 action is in the huh. picture it also figures that out that's cool and it did a great job uh both times that she did it i looked through all the pictures i had taken it looked like the best nice. we did it before the show i took some pictures of you but you mm. were like sitting there <laughs> and i was sitting here but i looked through the 14 pictures it took and yeah it chose the best one so it was pretty good cool slow-mo is really fun the slow motion uh, video capture it does it 120 frames per second uh, and I did some silly stuff, like I, I rolled a penny and like mm-hmm. showed it in slow mo. It's 120 frames, so it's not you know like crazy like 240, mm-hmm. where you can see every tiny little motion. Oh, sure. uh, but you know, I, I've seen some some that Engadget did of uh, a bumblebee flying, and you could see the wings. Mm. Um, I'm waiting to see a hummingbird so I can like <laughs> you know take a quick picture of it. Hold still, little hummingbird. Yeah, I gotta get on my phone. So the only thing bad about slow-mo is you have to switch it to slow-mo mode mm-hmm. uh, before you start shooting. Yeah. So if you shoot something normal, well, you don't get to see it in slow-mo. Right, yeah. But it makes sense. I get, It's got to switch it into slow-mo. Mm-hmm. It's doing something kind of fundamentally different to do yeah, that. Yeah, totally. Um, the True Tone Flash, that was the, the kind of the big killer feature on the, the camera. Yeah, yeah. With the two different LEDs. That sounds pretty cool. It is. It's really nice. Um, I, I took some pictures side by side with the iPhone 4S and the iPhone 5, and the, the picture was significantly better, well, better lit mm-hmm. uh, with the iPhone 5S. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to taking some night pictures and seeing mm-hmm. what it looks like. And it's really cool. Does it? Does it take, like, you know, I, I hate, and I, I'm i an amateur photographer, sure. I was in the past, not so much anymore, but, uh, you know, I hate indoor photography because 
people who use flash all the time. Flash looks awful anytime yeah. you've done any kind you of look photography. Like, I'm I'm pretty pale. Yeah, and in flash, I look like Casper. It, it makes people pale. It flattens out the image. It's yeah. incredibly unflattering. Yeah, the know. the amber light uh, it does make a significant difference. Like it looks more natural lighting. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's better. I, I'm no camera expert, so I mean, it just hey, it looks good. It looks a lot better than it used to. So well, hey, yeah. that's cool. The the camera or the um, f- flashlight app. I was kind of hoping that I could use like the amber light mm-hmm. and and see it, but it, no, it just does the bright white light. So they also, and this is an iOS seven thing, period. But I hadn't seen it yet because I hadn't updated to to iOS seven the full version. Mm-hmm. But they have new sounds. New so sounds. not just the old marimba. They actually have a whole new set of ringtones. Uh, this is the default one. This is called opening. It reminded me of the newsroom a little bit, just to. But, yeah, I don't, mean, don't, don't watch that. Oh, sorry. Well, yeah. <laughs> There's one that's that like, Jamaica man. Amber pointed out uh, it, it might be copyright violation because it really sounds like Owl City, and it's called Night Owl. It just sounds like something that he would have done. Yeah. So that's cool. Um, they got new ones for uh, alert tones as well. I'm alert. Hello. And the, the one that I like That's the most soothing. is Note. Bam. Because it just carries like a natural nice, bell. Yeah. So I like that one a lot. So yeah, so they have some... That's pretty some, cool. Some cool sounds. Uh, you can go back to the classic ones if you want to. And of course, you know, just like Marimba, everyone's going to have the exact same sound. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'll get annoyed and have to finally change it. I think we need some real classics. Sean, do you have that uh, that one? Uh, no. 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 Oh. Uh, I heard so. it played earlier. But. <laughs> well, so, yeah, that that's pretty much it. That's, okay. the, uh, that's the iPhone 5S. Cool. Uh, it's faster. Uh, the, the Touch ID is really awesome. And, uh, yeah, it's cool. I like it. I'm happy. It was worth it. And, and you know, <laughs> I had so much fun, uh, as much as I used to make fun of people. I might do it again. I might do mm-hmm. it next year. I might upgrade next year and do it again. No, oh, that's just, that's crazy. Time. That, I know it's crazy, but uh, I enjoyed it. I had fun. I'll just prepare a little bit better. Mm-hmm. So you got to take a nap beforehand. That's the key with these things. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I'm definitely going to take plan to take the day off. Um, so Tom, I know that you also recently got a new toy yes. and I was wondering if you want to talk about it a little bit. That was a geek one to talk about his new toy. Does Tim Cook own an iPhone? Ha, ha, but um, ha. okay, that was a bad yeah. joke. Yeah. Okay, so tell us about it. Uh, so the Chromecast. Okay, so explain to our listeners what a Chromecast is. All right. So we talk about Chrome all the time yeah. with Chromebooks and Chrome web browser. What's a Chromecast? Well, it's a Google product. That's the name Chrome. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, it's a little dongle that plugs into the HDMI port on your television. And when it's connected to your home Wi-Fi network, any device you own that can run Google's Chrome browser can send video and audio wirelessly to your TV through this Chromecast dongle. Okay. Uh, it works pretty well. And the real kicker is the price. It's 30 bucks. Yeah. Um, it actually came out kind of in, in the middle of summer. Uh, but at that low price, they basically sold out within 24 hours. <laughs> uh, I really wanted to get my hands on one and uh, couldn't for love or money. Uh, I, I guess I could for money if I want to spend 120 on yeah. eBay. But I was like, the whole point of this is that it's cheap. I'm not going to do that. I, I emailed uh, Google to see if we could get a review unit of it. It was like, yeah, no, <laughs> not, not. We, we don't even have any that we can use. <laughs> yeah. So I went ahead and put in an order on Amazon for one and it was just like whenever they ship it, they ship it. And I got an email a couple weeks ago. They had shipped it. Cool. Um, <clears throat> and the thing was when they announced it, uh, I had actually been looking for ways to do exactly what the Chromecast does, which is to stream wireless video uh, from my laptop to my TV. Because when I'm watching TV, probably 70% of the time, I'm streaming video from my laptop. Yeah. Um, and I was getting tired of having to lug my laptop in the living room because it's often set up in my bedroom. Mm. And uh, tripping over the 8-foot HDMI cable, I used to connect it and just dealing with that hassle. So I was like, I want to do this wirelessly. There's got to be a way. Yeah. And and there are ways. And Google's not the first company to come up with a way to broadcast video from a computer to TV. Right. Of course, the most popular way, I'd say, is probably the Apple TV. Right. Apple TV uh, is very nice, but you have to have a Mac. Right. And well, I don't. Um, 
And there's some newer Intel-based laptops that have a technology called Wide-Eye, which is quite similar to AirPlay yeah. um, that can do it. Uh, but my laptop doesn't have that either. And then there's uh, several third-party solutions out there, but they all have big two big drawbacks in my eyes. Um, they all require line of sight to the TV, so they have to actually be able to see the TV. And they can't just, you know do it through the Wi-Fi network, right. I guess. And they all start at $150 and go up from there. Yeah. So price is an issue. That was the thing like we were talking about before. Like when it comes to wireless, it's usually not good because it's usually not going on Wi-Fi. It's actually like on mm-hmm. some other uh, broad, uh, some other range. Um, but you can get Air Parrot for Windows. Um, it works on Windows or Macs. Um, it'll let you broadcast video from your Mac or Windows PC to an Apple TV. Uh, it only costs nine ninety nine for the program, but then again, you still have to buy a ninety nine dollar Apple TV. Okay, so it's still if you have Apple no TV. other reason for it, it's yeah. still one hundred ten bucks just to do this. Right. So when Google had announced that they had a thirty dollars solution to this problem, I definitely paid attention. So here's the thing that I don't understand: How does Chromecast actually work? How do you like set it up? Okay, so basically. Um, you plug the dongle into the HDMI port, and uh, the thing about HDMI is it does not provide, it's a, not a connection that provides power, so it actually, right. uh, you have to plug it into either USB, or they've got an adapter that you can just plug it into a wall socket. Oh, okay. Um, so that hangs off the side of your TV or the back. And, and it's um, like, it's about like that big. It's about yeah, two it's, it inches, like a, roughly. It looks like a large thumb drive. Yeah, I mean, it's, okay. it's pretty uh, compact. Um, and once you've got that set up, you've got to turn on your TV and, and switch over to that input. And uh, then it just walks you through a series of instructions. And the instructions, first, uh, they explain you how to get the dongle onto the uh, the network, the Wi-Fi network. Oh, okay. Uh, so you got to select your network and put in your password and whatever. How does that work? Do you have a keyboard? Can you use a keyboard with it? Or you use a mouse? How? You know what? How uh, do you connect your password? I did the setup, and I don't remember <laughs> that step. <laughs> that it's funny. magic. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I probably had to use the... Uh, I'm I'm sure you can use. The, Is there a remote, remote that comes with it? No, but I mean it's hooked into your TV. Oh, okay. So okay. So can you send any video to the TV with the Chromecast? Um, not everything. Uh, you have to have the Google Chrome browser installed because basically anything it's going to send to the Chromecast is going to send through the Chrome browser on your computer. On your computer, okay, or your phone. Um, that's the nice thing about Chrome is that it's available for the PC, for the Mac, for Android, and for iDevices. So okay. any of those can theoretically be talking to the Chromecast. Oh. Um, <clears throat> the, the the apps that have native support for Chromecast are YouTube, Netflix, and Google Play. So basically, okay. um, if you have any of those apps on your phone, um, you should see a square Chromecast icon. And if you touch that icon, it sends uh, whatever you're playing to the TV. And basically, uh, this this works really well. Um, the Chromecast actually does the streaming of the video or audio, um, and your phone or tablet just acts as the controller. So when you're doing those things, the Chromecast doesn't even, it's your, your computer or your phone doesn't have to get the signal and send it onto the Chromecast. Oh, okay. They just tell the Chromecast, hey, go check out this YouTube video. That's interesting. That's kind of how it works with YouTube on the Wii. Yeah. Uh, you can control it from your device, but it's actually the Wii connecting to YouTube and pulling the video down. Hmm. So, but what about things that don't have native Chromecast support, like Hulu? Right. So other? there's a Chromecast extension, which during the setup process you install on Chrome, so you can talk to uh, the Chromecast. Okay. And it puts a button on your browser that allows you to share any browser tab with Chromecast. Oh. So if you want to watch Hulu, you know, you just open it up in a browser tab and then share the entire browser tab, and it will show up on your TV. Oh, okay. And in that case, it actually is streaming through your computer and then to the Chromecast. So there's going to be a second or two delay. Oh, interesting. Uh, but, I mean, it's it's not a problem, you know. Okay. What about, like, local files? Can you play a movie that's on your hard drive or something um, like that? Yes. This is a little more limited. What I've discovered is that you can uh, actually play video, most movie files, through Chrome, which is basically okay. what you have to do. You have to play the file through Chrome and then share the tab, as usual, to the Chromecast. Now, the restriction is that it can't be a, a file that's a proprietary format. So this won't work for a Windows Media Player WMV uh, file. It won't work for Apple's uh, movie files um, okay. because Chrome you know, yeah. can't read those because they are not open. they got to buy the license for them and all that. Right. So overall, it works pretty well. Um, I would say sometimes the interface is a little bit clunky. I feel like 
you know, they make you do several clicks to share the Chrome tab. I'm like, I just want to share. I should just click it and then click it again to stop sharing. Like, yeah. take, a, take a page from Apple, guys. Come on. <laughs> it only does one thing, so you might as well. <laughs> should do it well. It should do it well. Um, and sometimes there can be a, little, a delay of a few seconds when you're starting a video. Um, and, of course, it doesn't support, as I just mentioned, every video format. Right. And I'd certainly like to see more apps have native support for it, more websites and stuff like that. But... For 30 bucks, I personally am willing to over forgive a lot of those quirks, yeah. and I've been using it a lot, and I've really been enjoying it. Cool. So, I'm going to come to your house and check it out. Yeah. I've cut the cord. I love it. It sounds like a classic Google product. Yeah. Which is kind of clunky at first, mm -hmm. but evolves into a menace to Apple. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I think it's already, like, uh, I didn't get, like I said, I didn't have it when it first came out. Um yeah. As I recall, it was a lot more limited what they were describing it could do at the time. I, I found yeah. I can share virtually every type of video file I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that was the case when it first came out. So it's one of those things that's going to get better. And, and you'll turn on your TV sometimes. And the interesting thing is, like, when you turn on, it's like it's another input. It's like a DVD player or something. That's how the TV okay. sees right, it. Right, right. And it actually runs kind of a screensaver. And it'll, you can just leave it on if you want. And it's oh, okay. just waiting for, you know, a broadcast. Um, but sometimes when you turn on, it'll for about a minute, it'll be like updating and it will do some kind of update. So it's uh, actually receiving updates and stuff. So it is a evolving product. Yeah, they're good about uh, about updating stuff over time. So mm -hmm. yeah, we'll see how it goes. Uh, it, it's something that I wanted to check out, but I realized that my TV didn't have an HDMI port. Oh, yeah, yeah. Same reason I don't have an Apple TV. Like, right. Didn't. Yeah, I should say that, you know, if you have a standard definition TV or an older TV that doesn't have uh, HDMI, don't get it because it's not going to work for you. It's strictly HDMI. Yeah, so going back to Martha's question, because we talked about this possibly yes, being a idea. solution to that, um, it would depend on what she's presenting. Right. She would have to, whatever she's presenting would have to be something that could somehow go through a browser. Right. You know, if it's a video file, she probably can play it through the browser. If it's uh, some website or something, uh, or a Google Doc of some kind, she could play it through the browser. But if it's a program, or if she needs to share right. her desktop, um, it's not a good solution because it can't do that Yeah. So at this time. It depends on what you're going to use it for then, Martha. Um, mm -hmm. It might work out for you. So, yeah. And it's $30. And they are available now mm -hmm. at Amazon and through Google and, Play and Store, I, right? Yeah, and I, Best Buy has them if you can find them in stock. Oh, okay. You know, cool. That's the big if. But I think they are in stock for the most part now. I haven't right. done a thorough canvassing of stores, but you have a better shot of finding them than you did in July. I'll and, say that. <laughs> and that price is fantastic. Yes. Um, uh, it's almost like they undercut themselves on the price. And it comes with a USB adapter, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Uh, where you can plug it into the wall? Yeah. 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 So if you don't have a USB port on your TV, right. you can plug it into the wall like uh, mm -hmm. like any phone charger and do it that way. Yeah, so. it's, a little, it's a little box about yay big. I mean, it's about, it's just amazing. Yeah. And there's nothing to plug into your computer. I kind of love that. That is pretty cool. You know? Yeah. Because I was, I was sort of envisioning I'd have to plug something into this, the Chromebook, and then unplug that and plug it into my regular laptop and go back and forth all the no, time. But nope. Plug it in. And man, like, I, one of the things I can do control through my phone too. Mm -hmm. So like, what I've discovered is, you know, it'll interface with Google Play. So I will just be walking around the house and be like, I want to hear some music. Turn the TV on, open up Google Play, send it <laughs> to the Chromecast. Done. That's cool. Yeah. All right. I'll have to check it out. All right, well, that is our gadgets. Uh, so we need to take a quick break. And when we come back, we have more questions from you guys. You're listening to Deemable Tech. Welcome back to Demobile Tech. I'm Tom Braun. And I'm Ray Hollister. I'm <laughs> just shaking things up. <laughs> All right. So we have an email from, uh, who's this from? Hoff. 
The Hoff. The Hoff. That's a. Uh, is that the Hoff? Well, you can't hassle like, the Hoff. Okay. Uh, this is X is actually uh, my my buddy Hoffy. All right. What's up, Hoffy? What's so his question? He writes. Uh, this is in response, I think, and I think you guys must answer this last week when I wasn't here. Okay. But he says, uh, for those without a domain name, Ray Tom, your listeners might be interested in uh, sneaker mail, sneak email dot com. They provide a fair price solution similar to what Amber and you do. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, we we talked about this uh, kind of offhanded um, when Amber was here filling in your rather rather large shoes. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, we talked about this. Uh, basically, we have our own domain names. So we have rayhollister.com and amberhollister.com. And we don't give our email address out to anyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, what we do is when they need to know what our email address is, like if we go to Best Buy and they're like, oh, can we get your email address for warranty? Sure. It's bestbuy at rayhollister.com. <laughs> or like when I picked up my phone. Like, wow, you are such a big fan of I Best know, Buy. I know, big nerds. Um, or like when I was at the Apple store, they were like, okay, let me get your email address. It's apple at rayhollister.com. And they're like, whoa. I'm like, I have everything at rayhollister.com. It all goes to my main email address. Mm-hmm. Um, what's nice so about that's that. that's why I have to send to Tom Braun at rayhollister.com. Yes, yes. And I have Sean Birch at rayhollister.com. <laughs> I give my email address to no one. Um, but no, it, it actually is really great for when you're filling out surveys or, mm-hmm. or mailing lists or whatever. Because you can find out very easily and simply who gave out your email address. Mm -hmm. Because when you start getting spam at Best Buy at RayHollister.com, figured it out. They're the ones that sold my email address. Um, So it it works out really easily. And it's very nice. Uh, But for folks who don't own their own email address, this service, I checked it out. It's Sneak Email. S-N-E-A-K-E-M-A-I-L dot com. It works basically the same way without all the hassle of owning a domain name and setting up your email servers and all that stuff that, nice. as a geek, I like doing, but most people don't. I'm a geek and I don't like doing it. You're yeah. Just, I think you're just strange. I am a little strange. <laughs> I've just done, I've set up so many websites and it's like, oh, this is easy. Do, 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 done. Uh, but this is, uh, sneak email is only $2 a month. So you can go, if you decide you don't want to do this anymore or you just want to do it for a little bit, you don't have to commit to buying a domain name. Um, and that's about the same price. I mean, yeah, $2 a, really a month price. works out to uh, $24, 24 a, year. a year. And a lot of sites, you pay the same price for mm-hmm. a domain. You can get a domain name cheaper, but again, you got to deal with the hassle of dealing with it. So, um, yeah, it's a, that, that's an interesting solution. Thanks. Thanks, Hoff. Don't that's hassle cool. the Hoff. All right. We got another email from a longtime listener, Jerry. Jerry. Jerry writes, <clears throat> excuse me. She didn't clear her throat. That was me. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> she writes. <clears throat> that's, yeah, you see how it's written. It's spelled very how do you How do you write <clears throat> in an email? Well, it's. <clears throat> <clears throat> oh, okay. <clears throat> and there's a dash between the <clears throat> and the. <clears throat> <laughs> Taking the joke too far. Come on, Tom. Let's go. <laughs> she writes for real. Okay, don't laugh. I just found an old computer game CD-ROM designed for Windows 95 and 98. I said don't laugh. <laughs> It's Sorry. Scrabble, and it would be more convenient Ooh. than online options sometimes since I'm in Africa. Well, yeah. <laughs> anyway, will this thing work on Windows XP? Also outdated now, I know. Yes. Will it crash my computer? Waiting anxiously for your response so I can get my Scrabble on. <laughs> that is so awesome. Um, yeah, that that's both hilarious. Um, XP, it's not outdated yet. XP is going to be still supported until next year. Yeah. yeah. And then it's completely dropping support. Um, so, yeah. If you have a Windows 95, 98 disk, it'll actually run all the way through Windows 8. Um, it may. It may yeah. run. Now, it may run. Yeah. I will say it <clears throat> definitely is not going to crash your computer. You're right. certainly safe yeah, you're to fine. try it. You know, go Give ahead. Give it a shot. Uh, most likely it will run. All you'll have to do is put the disk in and it'll probably auto run because even mm-hmm. back in Windows 95 days they had auto run. Um, however... If it doesn't work, uh, you might get an error. It might not work. You might have to run it in compatibility mode. Um, basically, all you would do is right-click it, and there'll be an option for compatibility mode. Mm-hmm. And click on it, and it'll ask you what version to run it in compatibility mode for. And it actually goes back all the way to 3.1. Really? On Windows 3.1, That's you can amazing. run it in that compatibility mode. Uh, what it'll do is it'll open up in a special window, and that window will let it run in the old Windows version. Uh, hmm. So you can run it in 95, 98. Uh, even 3.1, like I said, um, or uh, uh, NT, 
Windows 4.0 NT. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have something that only runs in that version of Windows, you can do it. Just right click it, click compatibility mode, and it'll it'll work. So cool. yeah, give it a shot. Find, let us know how that works because uh, that's hilarious. I've got <laughs> some floppy disks of uh, Carmen San Diego. Where in the world's Carmen <laughs> San Diego? And I just haven't taken the time to find my floppy disk player. Yeah, because I've got you I, have one somewhere. I have a USB floppy disk player. Really? It's an external USB because. When computers started dropping the US or the the floppy disk, mm -hmm. I said, "Oh man, I gotta get one." So I picked one up for like fifteen bucks, <laughs> you know, and I, it's somewhere. So I keep meaning to to install. The question is more if those discs are still good. Yeah, they're probably but dead. But if by they are, now. I'm coming over because <clears throat> I want to play a Space Quest Three. Oh, okay. I loved Carmen <laughs> San Diego though. All right, I got another question from Dave. He writes, "Hi, I have a Samsung Centura phone. I haven't heard of that." Do you know what version that is? Is that uh, I believe it's a Android? Android, and it's an Android phone, and it's running uh, for okay. ice cream sandwich. So. Oh, cool. Uh, he has a Samsung Centura phone that accumulates frequently called numbers. This is something different from the regular call log, which I can clear any time. The frequently called log is retaining every number I dial, and I cannot find a way to delete or clear this log. In fact, I would like to disable it altogether. He's... Uh, oh. He might be trying to hide numbers he's been calling. He's uh, like Tiger Woods. No, sorry. <laughs> uh, any help? Thanks very much. Okay, Dave. Um, hopefully we can help you. Uh, as Ray just indicated, we aren't really familiar with the Samsung Centura, and we don't have access to one. But we can kind of tell you what the Internet says about your problem. Um, I did a search on Google for Samsung Centura frequently called numbers, and I found someone complaining about the same issue that you have. Oh, maybe um, it's a Centura thing. Yeah. So another user responded to that, and apparently there is an app you can download that will do the trick of clearing the log out. Um, and the app is called History Eraser. History Eraser. One word. Yeah, one word. Yeah. And it's from Dumapic, D-U-M-A-P-I-C. That's in a the fun word. Google Play Market. Dumapic. Dumapic. Um, so basically all you do is download and install the app. Once you have the app, select Contacts, and then select the target that says All Frequently Called in the Favorites tab, and then press OK, and they're gone. Now, as far as I can tell, and again, I have not installed this. I have not, uh, I don't have access to this phone. Yeah. The app looks legit to me, um, but I haven't tried it. Uh, so this is a little bit of a case of use at your own risk. That said, if this issue is really driving you crazy, it might be worth trying. Now, you also mentioned maybe you'd like to get rid of this entirely. And the other option, and it depends on how brave slash industrious you're feeling, is to root the phone. Root. Yep. Once you root the phone, uh, you can basically get rid of the default stuff that came installed on the, the, in the entire interface, literally, and uh, install a completely customizable interface with the vanilla ice cream sandwich yeah. operating system. And that would certainly, because uh, obviously this this uh, frequently called log is something probably that, that came with, um, oh gosh, what's the provider here? I, I looked it up. It's uh, It's one of the... The off-brand phone providers like Smart Smart Talk or something like that. Oh, I'm not sure. You no. know what I'm talking about? No. Never heard of them. I'm, yeah, that's not. Oh, it. Straight Talk. Straight Talk. Yeah, they Ooh. have it. Yeah, the Galaxy. Oh, it's a Galaxy phone. It's a Galaxy Centura. Yeah. Ew. So, uh, so you might try that. Is I I would try um, if you're feeling again a little bit industrious. And when I say brave, you don't have to be very brave because it ruining is a pretty well-known, solid kind of thing to do at this point with Android phones. But uh, it does take a little bit of work. So uh, you could root the Centura, and you'll get full control over the entire phone, and you can get rid of anything you like, including the frequently called numbers log. Yep. And our friends over at Android Central uh, have some great resources on rooting. If that's something you're interested in doing, check them out at androidcentral.com. Mm -hmm. I say friends. I'm friends with them. I don't know if they like us. I mean... <laughs> Do they know about us? They know about us. Oh, okay. uh, I mean, uh, Phil Nicholson, the uh, editor-in-chief over there, he was on uh, on uh, First Coast Connect one time. Oh, cool. Um, so cool. love those guys. They're they're great with the Android net, uh community yeah uh, really good and Definitely yeah, a major resource if you have an android phone yeah and if you're interested in rooting like i said check them out they will show you everything and they have a great community that can help you out too cool. so check them out okay All we right. actually have uh just one more question and just this one, one more comes from our oh. facebook page oh uh, yes michael wrote all of a sudden an icon called home group appeared on my desktop i didn't do anything that i know of to get this whatever it is have i been hacked or what is it safe and if so what for? What is it for? And how did I get it? I'm running Windows 8, but not on a touch screen. 
Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, most likely it is safe. Um, you're you're probably fine. Although I can imagine if an icon with a really random name like that appeared on my desktop, I might get a little worried. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, I, like I said, I haven't heard of any viruses or hacks involving Home Group. Um, basically what happened is you or someone on your network was most likely playing or changing the file sharing settings on Windows 8. Um, a home group is something that is set up on Windows 7 and 8 that allows you to share documents, photos, music, videos, and printers with other people on your home network. So when you set up your home network, it automatically sets up a home group for you. Um, in the past, it was called Network Places mm-hmm. on XP and, and 98 and all yeah. them. Um, and then you could, same thing, share share documents, photos, music, etc. If you're the only one on your home network, you don't really need this. Yes, unless pointless. you have a lot of computers. <laughs> yeah. um, but if you do have other people in your family uh, that are on the same network, then this might be really helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, you can set it up so that they can make changes to your documents. Like you can collaborate on actual documents or spreadsheets or whatever. Or you can set it up so that they can only view them. So it's 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 up to you how you set it up. Um, you don't have to do anything about it. It's fine. You can leave it alone. It doesn't take up any space. Or it doesn't, you know, it doesn't take up any resources being there. Um, but if you do want to get rid of it, you can get it off your desktop. Um, you can actually leave your home group working and get rid of the icon if you yeah. just, you're like me and you're OCD about your icons and want to clear it out. Um, and we'll, it's basically just a shortcut. It doesn't yeah, represent yes. the setting or the program or anything. Yeah, if getting rid of it doesn't delete anything. Um, or you can get rid of your home group and all together and undo the network settings that allow you to share files on your network. But they're my homies, yo, in my home group. <laughs> That's what yes. home group makes me think of. Yeah, um, it sounds like that. So what we'll do, uh, it is pretty intricate, and there's a different way for doing it for 7 and for 8. Uh, but you have set, or 8. So uh, I will include links in the show notes. So go to our website at deemable.com and I'll include links to the show notes in the show notes uh, on how to remove the home group icon from Windows 8 and how to remove the home group icon from Windows 7 if any of our other listeners have Windows 7 and they want to remove it as well. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Did you answer any other questions? Uh, yeah, but not relevant to technology. Oh, <laughs> not questions that were asked of us. Yeah. All right. Well, then that's all we got. Uh, thanks for all your questions and keep them coming. Call us at our toll free number. It's 1 888 972 9868. Or you can always send us an email at questions at deemable.com. We're going to start doing something interesting next week. We're going to try and get some live calls. So if you're available between 6 and 7 or 6 and 8 Eastern Time, we might try to give you a call. We'll give you a call and schedule it beforehand. So let us know if you're available to call. Uh, Our producer is Sean Birch. Thanks to Robert Snyder for video production assistance. I'm Ray Hollister. I'm 